rejecting otherworldly existence, whose loneliness is misunderstood by the people as if it were a flight from reality, when in fact it's an affirmation of the only reality that exists. Um, this human of the future, he says, who will redeem us from the previous ideal as much as from that which had to grow out of it, from the great disgust, from the will to nothingness, this bell stroke of noon and the great, de uh, and the great decision that makes us the free will again and gives back to the earth its goal and to man his hope, that antichrist, that maybe a better translation would be anti-Christian, and anti-nihilist, this conqueror of God and of nothingness, he must one day come. And the name, the label that he gives for the person who represents this reversal, both rejecting the Christian moral asceticism and also allowing us, therefore, to overcome the threat of nihilism, is Zarathustra. And so he just gives the name Zarathustra um, to um, represent this kind of reversal. I, say, I want to say one more time about the connection between overcoming God, that is overcoming asceticism and moral values, the connection between that and overcoming nihilism. Because the ascetic ideal, Nietzsche thinks, um, involves a kind of hidden nihilism. And that, not, and that nihilism has been disguised from us, has been hidden from us, but now the developments that come out of morality, the developments that come out of the history of the aesthetic ideal, have now uncovered that. And so that's the sense in which the development of morality, the development of the aesthetic ideal over time, has come to undermine itself. That's the sense in which morality is threatening to collapse on itself these days and leave us with not. So overcoming that system of self-undermining values really is the same as uh, finding a way of saving us from not. Okay, so that, that's the end of the second treatment. Um, obviously, here in the third, I'm going to have to go um, pretty quickly skipping some things. But first, I want to remind you um, about the structure of this treatise. Back in the preface, uh, in section eight, he says that um, it's really hard to read carefully. You have to discipline yourself. We don't really understand these days how to read or interpret aphorisms, and so he says, um, he's going to give an example of this. And the third treatise is a commentary, he says, on an aphorism which he said has been placed before this treatise. The treatise itself is a commentary on it. So, so this whole um, treatise is supposed to be a commentary on the aphorism. And there's a question. What he means by this? Um, what the aphorism is that he's talking about? And if you look on page 67, usually the way this is tr treated is that somehow or other the essay is supposed to be a commentary on the, um, the epigram the little quote from Zarathustra that starts this. But this doesn't really make much sense. It's hard to understand how this is a commentary on this. Um, and it turns out that this was something that was only realized very recently, like maybe 15 years ago, um, that um, the, what he calls the aphorism that the entire treatise is a commentary is actually section one. So section one is a very condensed statement uh, starts with what do ascetic ideals mean? 
And then it runs through a few different, very condensed statements about what, what it means, uh, what the ascetic ideal means, um, before sort of concluding by saying something I'll talk about in a moment. And then he imagines himself saying, am I understood? Am, have, I been under, have I been understood? And then he imagines the reply coming back, absolutely not, dear sir. And then he replies again, then let us start at the beginning. Okay, so section two then starts again at the beginning. And all of these sections for the rest of the treatise now are explaining, interpreting, the structure that he just laid out in section one. So it turns out that section one here was a late addition. It was added at the final stages of publication of this book and is a kind of outline for the entire third treatise. Okay, so let's just make sure we're clear about what the ascetic ideal is. Uh, this treatise is going to be an interpretation of it, an attempt to understand the meaning of it. Um, but the ascetic ideal itself is uh, the idealization of asceticism. And that means that it's the belief that the best human life is one of self -denial. The best life is one in which we um, are committed to denying ourselves. And notice now that in rejecting the ascetic ideal, this is not necessarily the same as rejecting what the ascetic ideal has created or what the ascetic ideal has generated. Nor is rejecting the ascetic ideal the same as rejecting discipline or self-discipline. It's re instead what it is, is rejecting a certain kind of idealization or basis for discipline as good in itself. By saying that we should discipline ourselves because self-denial is good. That's what's being rejected. OK, so what do ascetic ideals mean? Notice the plural here. What do ascetic ideals mean? There are different meanings for different ascetic ideals. And so we get several different answers. Um, for example, um, so this is just that line five. It says, among the physiologically failed and out of sorts, Namely, among the majority of mortals, most of us are sick in one way or another, or weak or feeble in one way or another. Among physiologically failed and out of sorts, the ascetic ideal appeared is an attempt to appear to oneself to be too good for this world, a holy form of excess. Their principal instrument in the battle with slow pain and boredom. Okay, so um, um, so the first thought here is that the ascetic ideal um, is a way of showing ourselves that we're superior to the things of this world. So we. Um, the things that, we're deny that we are denying ourselves through asceticism really aren't important, really aren't valuable after all. Okay? So when someone is weak and frail and unable to accomplish things in this world, they comfort themselves by saying, those things aren't actually important. And I will show that, I will prove that to myself by denying myself those things. Continuing. Among priests, the true priest's faith, their best tool of power, um, it's also the most high permission to power. Um, that the ascetic, skipping down the line, that, that the ascetic ideal has meant so much to man, however. So, there are a few examples of what the ascetic ideal means in different contexts. But, he says, that the ascetic ideal has meant so much to man, 
however, is an expression of the basic fact of the human will. It's horror vacuum. Namely, it needs a goal. And it would rather will nothingness than not will. Um, okay, so um, this is the sort of paradoxical core statement that Nietzsche is going to be unfolding throughout this um, throughout this treatise. So the sort of so the basic fact about the human will is that it would rather will nothingness than not. So if we find ourselves in a position moving toward an inability to will, like from weakness, for example, if we find ourselves frustrated and not able to put our will out into the world, if we find ourselves in a position where we cannot express our will to power, it's going to be directed back ourselves, so to speak, and we will find that willing nothingness, under the aesthetic ideal, is a way of expressing our will to power. It's a way of willing, of willing rather than not willing. Okay, so the idea running through these various examples here um, is that where we see asceticism, where we see self-denial, what we should be looking for is to find some hidden affirmation. So what on the surface looks like and is asceticism, that is self-denial, what we should be looking to try to uncover below the surface is some kind of affirmation. So the ascetic ideal is um, primarily hostility to our embodied existence here on Earth. Um, it's the source of resentment. Um, but maybe by looking at these different expressions of uh, the aesthetic ideal, we're going to hopefully find something that uh, actually turns out to be a positive affirmation. Um, so we're looking for some sense of affirmation uh, that's hidden in self denial under the aesthetic idea. Um, okay, so I'm going to. Okay, so the first uh, aspect of it that he discusses is um, in the idea of art, um, asceticism in art. I'm going to skip over that and move quickly to asceticism among philosophers. I'm going to be brief about this also. Um, so this is starting on 71. Um, just about the middle of page 71. It says, and with this, we have arrived at the more serious question. What does it mean when a real philosopher pays homage to the ascetic idea? A spirit who really stands on his own, like Schopenhauer, a man and knight with a brazen glance, who has the courage to himself, who knows how to stand alone, and does not first wait for front men and nods from the high. So someone who genuinely, powerfully expresses this uh, aesthetic ideal. Um, okay, and at this point he then goes into a discussion of Kantian, listen carefully, Aesthetics. So this is like theory of art, not to be confused with asceticism. Okay. So in the theory of art, in aesthetics, what Kant says is that aesthetic pleasure is disinterested pleasure. So in order to appreciate the beauty of a work of art, for example, Kant says we can't take any interest in it. So it's not satisfying any desire that we have, no practical interest, no desire. And um, so Kantian aesthetics are disinterested. Um, and Schopenhauer uh, follows this. Schopenhauer takes a Kantian line on this point. And yet, as Nietzsche explains, he writes with such vigor and